wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. And just when I ran out of the road, I met a man I didn't know. And he told me that I was not alone. You picked me up, you turned me around, you placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because you healed my heart, you changed my I thank the Savior, I thank God. I cannot deny what I've seen. Got no choice but to believe. My doubts are burning like ashes in the wind. So, so long to my old friend burden and bitterness you can just keep them moving no you ain't welcome here from now till i walk streets ago i'll sing of how you saved my soul this wayward son has found his way back home you picked me up you turned me around you place my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because you heal my heart, you change my name. Forever free, I'm not the same. I thank the master, I thank the savior, I thank God. Hell lost another one, I am free. I am free, I am free. Hell lost another one, I am free. I am free, oh I am free. Hell lost another one, I am free. I am free, I am free. Hell lost another one, I am free. I am free, yes I am free. Hell lost another one. I thank the Savior because you heal my heart. You change my name forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior because you picked me up. You turned me around and placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior because you heal my heart. You change my name forever free i'm not the same i thank the master i thank the savior i thank god We long for you. 
Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. Hosanna. Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praises. Hosanna. Hosanna. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. Hosanna. Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. Worthy of all. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Fire and wind, come and do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Fire and wind, come and do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room. You're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Come down, Spirit, when you.
you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Holy Grandeur earth is quaked before, moved by the sound of his voice. Seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my regard. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you, and it is well with me. Far be it from me to not believe Even when my eyes can't see And this mountain that's in front of me Will be thrown into the midst of the sea And through it all, through it all my eyes are on you through it all through it all it is well through it all through it all my eyes are on you and it is well it is Ways 
Let's just continue to praise the Lord in, in prayer at this moment. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for, for the word that you've given us, and that word is Jesus. And we thank you for the testimony and the revelation that we have through your word. Lord, we just come to you this morning with open hearts and open ears that we hear and receive your word and that we put it into practice in our everyday lives so that we can be that shining light on that hill for your glory. And Lord Jesus, everything that we do, let it be for your glory and your name. Heavenly Father, we thank you, our Savior, our Creator, our everything, our lives. We owe it all to you, Lord, all for your glory. In your powerful, wonderful name, Jesus, we all say amen. George, if you want to take a moment here, I'll just take five minutes and say, uh, how do you do to everybody? All right, good morning, church. If you want to go ahead and take your seats, we're going to go ahead and get going here. At this time, if I can get our ushers to go also get ready to receive this morning's tithe and offering. This morning, if it's your uh, first time, if you're visiting with us, uh, or if you just need some prayer, we have our Connect card. You should be able to find one in front of you in the seat ahead. If not, please reach out uh, to an usher and we can try to get you one. Uh, we've filled that out. You can go ahead and put it in the box by the door in the back if you have any prayers or if you just want to reach out and uh, connect with us this morning. Please do so through that connect card. We have our ushers for the uh, tithes and offering. As we get ready for tithes and offering, just, Laura, I just want to pray over this uh, offering and tithes this morning that It'd be a blessing to not only you, but to the giver. We're told to be a cheerful giver, and Lord, that 
We ask that you just open our hearts uh, every day, every moment, and be generous, and uh, use this time to freely give to you as you freely give to us, and that it just be a blessing uh, to ourselves and to all of your uh, creation, Lord. We thank you. Amen. As we take, uh, as we uh, collect here, we have a, an honor to have our guest speaker this morning, Pastor Jim Duncan, and uh, just some uh, background for, for him. He's an ordained minister with the uh, Assemblies of God, and he served as the senior pastor of Peninsula Christian Center in Soldatna for over 20 years. Following his role in the peninsula beginning around 2012, he started working with the state as the prison chaplain, chaplaincy coordinator for all of Alaska. That's a big task. In addition to this, his vital role to the incarcerated, Jim is the chairman for the annual governor's prayer breakfast planning committee. Jim and his wife Renee love our state and are key leaders in seeing the advance of the cause of Christ in the last frontier. So I hand it over to Pastor Jim Duncan. Matt Nuska Assembly, glad to see you. I'm on the work release program from Department of Corrections, so clock is running. <laughs> Praise God. You know what they say about prison chaplains? Nobody leaves till they say they leave. And um, so keep the doors locked until the CO comes and releases you. I'm just kidding. I don't preach long. It just seems that way. My, uh, I, I rise to honor your wife. I mean, your pastor and his wife, <laughs> your wife too. Um, I love Scott and have known him for a number of years, and I'm delighted that he's here. He is an encourager. He is a Barnabas. It's in his spirit to encourage you. You're going to be blessed in his tenure here at Matanuska Assembly. I'm so glad that he's here. Um, very involved in the community already, he jumped right in with both feet. Of course, he knows the valley very well, and I think that that goes to your favor. You're blessed. And I just thank God for the opportunity to fill the pulpit. I also, I know so many of you, like Jackie and John, uh, wonderful friends to Jean Hughes, who's like connected to my wife and I, marvelous lady that we've known for my entire life. But um, Jackie, I miss her. And, and then Barney Sweeney, good grief. I love that guy. I love his prison ministry and what he did. So this church has marvelous connection for me. I love what, um, what you give to prison ministry in this church. And I love being connected here. I preached here many years ago, probably when this carpet was a lot newer and pews. And, and um, I can't remember what year, but Dale Humphrey was here then, first time. And, of course, uh, Randy... And his wife, I've known him since their years in Fairbanks. So, and then Dennis, Dennis, I mean uh, um, uh, Ed and Dennis were roommates at UAF and popped into our church in Fairbanks where I was a youth pastor. My wife, 21 years old, newly married. I remember this, Ed, about you and Dennis. My wife comes through. You, you know what I'm going to say? My <laughs> wife says, "I want to leave the uh, young college age," and. Uh, 21 years of age, newly wed, hadn't lived in Alaska, but just a few months. And here comes Dennis and Ed, and they were very faithful to Renee's class. And she had such a, a broad span of age groups, from people like Richard Wenzel that you might remember, and Dave Hastings, two giant guys that were up in years and single all their life. They were pipeline kind of guys that uh, just planted their roots in Fairbanks, and so some wonderful, Mike Allison, uh, Donna Johnson, you may remember, and um, I know Ed, if she was here, she would say thanks for your support, thanks for your uh, faithfulness to her college and career class. Uh, that was her first ministry opportunity in Alaska, and you guys were real faithful to her teaching in her class, so thank you. Praise God. Enough with the announcements. Are you ready to rock and roll? Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41. Like you, I woke up yesterday and learned of the uh, attack on Israel by Iran. 
over 300 missiles and drones. You know, that's a game changer. That's not just hitting an ascent, uh, 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 a uh, uh, place where you might have some Hamas rebels funded by Iran. That's not an embassy in Syria. This is a direct attack. This is game changer. And um, you might have been watching the news last night or this morning, and you might have thought, oh, brother, here we go again. You might have thought, this world is going to hell in a handbasket. Well, I'm on a mission, and I've preached this message a couple of times, but I'm going to 2.0. This world is going to hell in a handbasket 2.0. I want to eradicate that from our language as Christians because it's not in the Bible. I have not found anywhere that tells me that God said that he is sending this world to hell in a handbasket. And what that term means, it means quickly and you can't stop it. That's what it means. It's just going to happen so fast, it'll, it'll put you into a tailspin. But nowhere in Scripture does it say, I'm sending the world to hell in a handbasket. In fact, it is totally the opposite. Totally. I like Genesis 3.15. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. I know we like to think crush, but look at it in the original. I like Colossians 2, 9 through 14. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made in public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. That doesn't sound like anybody's going to hell in a handbasket. I like Revelation 21 through 22. It speaks to the plan. It speaks to the end. It talks about heaven and river of life, reward, and Jesus calling himself the son of the living God, God the I am, and the fact that there's no mention of going to hell in a handbasket. The Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And why would God send heaven's best to earth to be born, to live, to die, and be raised from the dead if you're going to just send everybody to hell in a handbasket? Church, we got to stop saying this. We're not helping anybody by communicating that this world is going to hell in a handbasket. For one thing, it's just not true. It's not true. It's not God's plan. In fact, Revelation 22, 20 says, Surely I am coming quickly. And the response, Amen. Even so, Lord, come quickly. And so, I want to respond. I want to eradicate the thinking of this world is going to hell in a handbasket, and I want to give you three reasons. I want to give you reason number one, calling. Reason number two, equipping. And reason number three, sending. God is still in the business of calling, of equipping, and of sending. And if those things ever stop, then you can start communicating that we're going to hell in a handbasket, because we don't have a chance. If God stops calling, if God stops equipping, if God stops sending. So, in Isaiah 41, I begin with verse 9. You whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest regions and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not cast you away. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. 
Behold, all those who are incest against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. They shall be as nothing. And those who strive with you shall perish. You shall seek them and not find them. Those who contend with you, those who war against you, shall be as nothing, as a non-existent thing. For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. Fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you, says the Lord, and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The first thing is, out of verse 9, I pick up the word and called from its furthest regions. God called him. God is still in the business of calling. It's always to himself first and then to what? Do you understand that? Always to himself. He calls. And we, someplace along the line, you're here today because you answered a God call upon your heart to himself. He drew you to himself. And then the call goes to what? I believe there's a mission. My wife is in Pakistan today, and she uh, uh, has been doing ministry in, to some people in Pakistan since prior to, nine, to 2012. We started doing an online ministry. We didn't know where this was going. Amazingly, amazing uh, amount of Muslims, uh, some Hindu, a few Hindu along the border, but we started outreaching to a guy who was a worship leader, but he felt he needed to be an evangelist, and he didn't know how. So I feel called that I'm supposed to be an evangelist, but I don't know how to do it. And I passed this off to my wife, said, you deal with them. I'm busy. I didn't know where. I just looked to me to be another thing I didn't need to do. She took it, ran with it. One guy turned into two guys in two different cities. Karachi and Lahore, two of the bigger cities. And John said, uh, said she calls, calls my wife, Mother Renee, Mother Renee, will you, will you do a video on what? Evangelism. You mean to teach you? And Yes. Teach us how to get saved, how to communicate. So she did. She put this little thing on her camera. It's about 15 minutes long. John took it and a sheet a bed sheet and a projector and he took it to a village and he put it up and he said, come to the crusade. And a hundred people got saved. A hundred people. Wow, I said, wow, you need my help? Those are good numbers, huh? You need any help? No, I don't need that. We're doing just fine. And John went to another village, bigger results, and another one, bigger results, and another one, bigger results. And Renee said, stop using it. Let's do something more. And so she started doing it live. And this week, I don't know what the numbers will be, but they can be in excess of 30,000 that will come to the crusade. And it's easy to get 5,000. Now listen, we've seen great crusades in Argentina, Brazil, Bernard Johnson, We've seen Reinhard Bonnke in Africa, and, and we've seen Siberian ministry and Russian ministry back in the 80s, late 80s and early 90s, but we haven't seen these kind of numbers in a Muslim country. God is on the move and calling. And so she's over there training them and also doing crusades, and uh, together we've traveled over there and done crusades along with one other pastor from out here in the valley. God is still in the business of calling. Don't ever think we're going to hell in a handbasket if God is still going to be calling people out of darkness and into light. I'm in prison ministry. I see it every day. Every time, in fact, <clears throat> we just had a baptismal service. We often do this on Palm Sunday or Easter Sunday. And this will happen mainly at Highland Mountain. There'll be a, a gal that'll get in the tank with Chaplain Blodgett, she'll give her testimony. And this one particular gal, this happened. She looked down in the front row, and her former Sally was right there. She goes, ah, you're back. Yeah, she's back. She says, you need Jesus in your life. She's preaching from the tank and starts talking to her 
former Sally, and the house is full. The chapel is full. And start talking to her about what she needs this time to become successful to get out and not come back. The worst calling you can ever answer is a recidivism calling to go back to prison. We don't want you to come back to prison. We want you to become a productive member of the community, be an asset to your church and to your community. We want to let Jesus do a work in your heart. So the young lady on the front row, she starts crying. The girl in the tank, she starts being emboldened. She starts preaching Jesus to her. You need to do it right now. And I will pray with you from this tank right now to give your heart to Jesus. So she did. The girl crying on the front row. Others are doing the same. And then when she got all done, she says, and now you know what you need to do? Yeah, I, know. I think I know what I need to do. You need to come up here and get in the tank and get baptized too. And she did. We always carry an extra towel, an extra schmuck, uh, because it almost always happens somebody else wants to be baptized as well. I'll tell you another story later if we have time. The call of God is still ongoing. You're not going to hell. This world is not going to hell in a handbasket because God is still in the business of calling. Calling to himself first and to what? Second. Renee's on the flight. And somebody says, so why are you going to Pakistan? She just begins to share. And, a, and a, uh, the stewardess was listening. And she kept coming by and listening. And Renee noticed she was giving an ear to what was going on in the conversation. Finally, she stopped with Renee and said, I need to find my purpose. And I want to tell you, body of Christ, every person in the body of Christ needs to find their purpose. What, how can you serve? What can you do? Jesus said, I came to serve, not to be served, but to serve. So serving is a part of calling. Call to who first? It's to God. And then to what? And I encourage you. You might think, well, I, I haven't heard God's voice. Don't wait to hear God's voice. Get up and get moving. Just start getting momentum and you'll find your calling. You will find your calling. I love it in the scripture when God calls Noah, Moses, Samuel, David, Elijah, Elisha, Naomi, Ruth, Esther. You go all the way through the Bible and they all find a purpose. Call to who first and to what second? Then the second thing is equip. We're halfway done now. You're going to make it. So in the scripture, verse, particularly um, verse 14, fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you, says the Lord, and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make you into a new threshing sledge with sharp teeth. <laughs> you remember junior high. For me, it was junior high. Do you remember when you started dissecting? If you got into junior high, they don't let sixth graders play with sharp knives. They wait till you're in junior high. How smart is that? <laughs> and you got to dissect the frog and the clam and the starfish and, and a number of other things. I remember Jane Ellis, it was just before lunchtime and she was hungry and we had gone down to the beach and picked up starfish and come back to our junior high, Marie Drake Junior High in Juno. And she ate part of that on a dare. And I thought, oh, Jane, I don't know what's going to become of you. We, but junior high kids were just enthralled because they got, and we opened up the worm. And the thing, I only remember two things from the worm. Number one, we don't have worms that big in Alaska. They were thick things, and they were shipped in somehow. Back when the state had money for junior hires to dissect things kind of reflective of this weekend's action. You open up the worm, and it doesn't have teeth. It has no teeth. It can't even gum things to death. And it has five hearts. Do you remember that? Did, am I the only one that dissected the worm in junior high? Yeah? Okay. Do they still? You still have a science class? So it doesn't have a, any teeth, but it does have lots of heart. It has five hearts. Now, I know you think, well, you can chop it in half, and it, one part will crawl off that way. And one, I'm not so sure that that's true. I think it needs all five hearts. I mean, why, why would you have five hearts if you didn't need them? But that part, I get. But here in Scripture, 
God is saying, yes, I know you don't have teeth, you worm. First of all, who calls a nation a worm? We call England, you know, the lion. Uh, we have the Impala of South America, or uh, of uh, South Africa. We have we have the eagle, we have the bear, we have the falcon, we have other critters that are great images for a nation. But a worm? Who calls a nation a worm? God does. Because he's going to show Jacob, you can't do this on your own. This is impossible. And this is where we go from the call. When you find out your purpose, and it's bigger than you, you can't do it on your own. But... God will do for you. If you hear nothing else from me today, hear this. God will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. This is my mantra. I, you'll hear this from me a lot. My girls sometimes go, la, 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 la. I can't hear you, Dad, because they've heard some of these things forever. My verbitage, if you would, is that God can do for you what you can't do for yourself. You're Second Corinthians Four, seven. You're an earthen jar. And not only that, you got holes and you're scarred, mangled, beat up a little bit. Don't look like you used to look. You're not cuddly and warm anymore. I'm speaking to myself. You're an earthen jar to show that the power comes from God and not you. It's not in you to do this. You can't, if you were born without teeth and have no chance of having any teeth, you can't be sent to the mountain to turn it into chaff. You don't have teeth. And God says, I will equip you. I will put it. He's going to give them false teeth. Oh, not just today. These are sharp false teeth. Do you get this picture? You wake up in the morning as a worm. What a nice way to greet a person. Hey, you worm. You're nothing but a worm. But Jacob's in the right place to hear from God when he realizes we can't do this on our own. And we're in the right place to answer the call when we understand and recognize we can't do it on our own. God will equip us. And so God equips the children of Israel and says to them, fear not, you worm. <laughs> this is the best trash talking that God has ever done in the Bible that didn't involve Satan. You men of Israel, I'll help you, says the Lord. Underline verse 14 in your Bible. And every time the enemy of your soul comes along and says, you can't do this, you go, yeah, I know. But greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Stick around, Satan. God's going to give me sharp teeth. You're not going to want to be around. I will help you, says the Lord, and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. That is powerful. And so little Israel sits surrounded by Arab nations, surrounded by enemies. Oh, it has the sea on one side, but it's surrounded by people that don't like Israel. Watch it. The Redeemer. The Bible says, and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. It is not because of 1948 and Truman that America stands by Israel. It precedes what he said. He said, we recognize Israel as a nation. That was monumental to the Arab world and to the world as we knew it then. But every believer, including one of the counselors to Truman, who was not very religious, but had a background to understand Genesis 12, I will bless those who bless you. So if, you, if you're thinking, well, in America, 1948, we stand by Israel because Truman said, and we set things up for him, and England was still sort of standing by him, but not really, not like they do today. It goes back to Genesis chapter 12, when God spoke to Abraham, I'll bless those who bless you. And every believer in America understands that. We know that. That's where it originally started from, that God will do it. And when he says here, I am your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, 
I'll do for you what you cannot do for yourself. And you're going to see it in the coming days. I don't know what. I'm not saying it's, this is apocalyptic. I'm just saying it's a great opportunity for God to show himself real to the people of the Middle East. We're right on the threshold of seeing God break loose something incredible. I don't know what God has in store. This little nation has no right to physically exist except one thing. I'll bless those who bless you. And the minor prophet, God says, I chose Jerusalem because I chose Jerusalem. <laughs> it was a sovereign act of God. And so, Jacob, you worm, I will equip you with sharp teeth, and you will turn the mountains into chaff. But don't miss that last part of that. I'm your redeemer. This doesn't happen unless you and I have a redeemer. I'm your redeemer. Note this. The holy one of Israel. <laughs> Do you understand how powerful that is? For you and I, too. Because we've been grafted in. We're a part of the kingdom of God. Jesus did a work in our life, and we recognize he's our redeemer. God has redeemed us through Jesus. If you're here today and you've never made a decision to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life, I encourage you, open up your heart store right now and say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my heart. Do for me what I can't do for myself. I can't redeem myself. I can't find my way and work my way back to right relationship with you. I can't do it. But you've already done it for me. Jesus, become Lord and Savior of my life. I invite you into my life to set up residency in my life. Hallelujah. So the call of God and then the equipping. And God is still in the business of equipping people. So if you think that you can't do, watch out. You're in the prime position to learn that God will do for you what you can't do for yourself. He will equip you. Can you say amen? Praise God. Just want to make sure that the CEO hasn't come and picked you up and taken you back to your cell. We're here for one more point. One more point, and then we're done. And that last point is what God will do in sending. Verse 15. Behold, I will make you into a new threshing sledge with sharp teeth. You shall winnow them. The wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them. You shall rejoice in the Lord and glory in the Holy One of Israel. In other words, God's going to send you out. You're going to go out. This is what you're going to do. Listen, why would God equip anybody if there wasn't a task to do? He's equipping because there's still a task to be fulfilled. I don't know what your task is, but God is in the business of calling. He's in the business of equipping, and he's still in the business of sending. And so the worm is going to crawl to the mountain with his new set of teeth, and he's going to winnow that mountain into chaff, and it will be blown away, and the enemy against Israel will no longer be there. They're going to be gone. Because God's still in the business of sending. I, I liken this to Jesus' teaching on three major parables I don't have enough time to go into. But remember, the parable of the 99 and 1. And he sends the shepherd for one. He sends the shepherd out even for one lost sheep. Church, don't give up on the one. Will you remember the one? 99 out of 100 sounds really good. If you're in baseball, you're getting Otani money, $70 million contract or better, to, to have a huge batting average and a great, a, a, a great pitching uh, average. and All these things that amount up to the number one salary in Major League Baseball. 99 and 1 is even better. 99 and 1 is great odds. Lord, aren't you happy? 99 and 1, that's not bad. Well, that's not bad for you and I, but what if that one is your relative? What if it's your spouse, your son, your daughter? 
What if it's your good friend? Don't give up on the one. God doesn't give up on the one. I, I know you may be thinking, hey, my theology has some issues that there will be some people. I know. I know that. But if the one lost is one of my grand, one of my five grandbabies, you better go after them. I'm not giving up on them. If, if it's your son or your daughter or your spouse, you don't want to, you, you're not quitting. Send, send, Lord, send. Send the shepherd out. One's lost. One is lost. 99 and one. I know ultimate redemption, and some people have a huge theological problem with that, and I understand that. I, I do. I get it. We could go to Calvinism and Arminianism. I like both those guys. They were nice. But if the one lost sheep belongs to you, you're not willing. You agree with what Peter said. Not willing that any should perish. This is the heart of God. God's still in the business of sending because not willing that any should perish. Do you know that there are evangelists that are poking and prodding and crawling and sneaking into North Korea with Bibles? Do you know that when the, when the communists took over North Korea, there was a church on the banks of the river started by a martyr who died, taking the gospel there, and they picked up his Bible when he was killed, and they plastered the walls with it. Because no one could just, they didn't want the Bible going to just one particular household. So people would come and they would pray and they would walk along the walls and read the scripture. Not wanting any to perish in North Korea. Not wanting any to perish in Iraq or Iran. Not wanting any to perish in Pakistan. God's still sending. His, his, name, is, his name is Gilbert. Um, oh, I shouldn't use his name. Let's call him Mr. G, if you'll agree with me. Mr. G uh, was the worst inmate inside Department of Corrections. He had no hope. He had to be strapped. All four limbs had to be strapped down in his cell. He was in House 1 in Spring Creek in Seward, which is the end of the road for Alaska. There's no other place. There's no other place that they can send you with higher security. He was the million-dollar man. He took a million dollars a year of Alaska money to manage him. He went in about 2012. It's almost been two years since uh, we were asked to help with Mr. G. I can tell you that the Department of Corrections also asked every state in the nation to possibly take him and trade out with him. We often trade out, take inmates that need to disappear in other states. They get sent to Alaska. Alaska has inmates that can't handle. They'll send it to another state. But Indiana said no. Texas said no. Louisiana that has Angola, they said no. We can't handle them. We looked at the file. We can't handle them. A million dollars a year. So mental health came to us and said, "Would you? what could you do with him? Oh, man, alive. Scary. Very scary. And we... we uh, took it to our guys in our faith program and said, what do you think? And here's what one of them, they're, they're all quiet because some of them know him because they also came from Spring Creek. They worked their way out of Spring Creek. They were at some other facilities. They knew this guy, Mr. G. But one of the guys was silent. And one of the guys says, Chaplain, either what we got works or it doesn't work. And they all said, that's right. Bring him in. They brought him in. They circled the wagons. They began to pray over him. And God sovereignly delivered him. And not only his reading and writing skills were non-existent. And he began to, he began to read with understanding and write. It's been a few months. And today he's prepping to teach John Bevere's class tomorrow morning the bait of Satan. It's been 18 months and he hasn't been written up one time or needed to be strapped down one time or anything along that line. And the other fellow inmates have voted him to be a part of senior leadership. So Department of Corrections sends the mental health lady with another one and says, we've got another one we can't handle. What do you think? Can you take him in? I could tell you tons of stories about 
about Mr. G's development along the way, but we don't have time. So we said, I think it was the same inmate, said, well, either what we got works or it doesn't work. And Mr. G hasn't been written up in 18 plus months, almost two years. In fact, what's really interesting, never had a roommate till he came to the Faith Mod. And the guy who volunteered to be his roommate was a, was a reading specialist and could help him read. Volunteered to be in his cell. Nobody has ever volunteered to be in the same cell with this guy. So mental health says, we got another one. Big guy. Multiple uh, tours of uh, Afghanistan. Couldn't couldn't come back into society and weave his way in culturally back home. He's a mess. Could you handle him? So the guys voted, said, bring him on. And the minute he stepped into the mod, Mr. G went up to him and said, Mr. G's very short, and he said, I know what you're thinking. And I'm sure the inmate said, you have no idea what I'm thinking. And Mr. G looked up to him and said, give it a chance. This works. And that big former GI gave his heart to Christ and has revolutionized transformation in his heart and in his life. How's that happen? Because people feel sent to do ministry inside institutions like your own Barney Sweeney did. To minister to places they never had a thought of ever doing it. I'm not here to recruit you for prison. I'm here just to recruit you. God is still in the business of calling. He's still in the business of equipping you. I don't know if Barney ever felt equipped to do prison ministry, but he did it very well. And, and he's still in the business of sending. Father, I love your word, and I love when it speaks to us. I love the way it transforms our heart and our life. I love what you're doing in our life, and I love what you're doing in the Matsu Valley. I love what you're doing all across this valley. And I thank you for what you're doing right here. And there's probably three or four people that can say, I don't know my calling. I don't know my purpose. I'm still searching. I'm still wondering. And I pray, Holy Spirit, be their partner to speak into their life, to drop a hint, to begin to prod, begin to move, and begin to order their steps for a calling of God upon their life. It may be monumental. It might not be on anybody's radar. But if there's someone who's headed to hell, maybe even in a handbasket, it might be just enough to tip the scale. It might be just enough to win the one. It might be just enough so that not none perish. And we're all working together to see a fulfillment of God's calling, God's equipping, and God's sending. In Jesus' name. Would you stand with me? Praise God. I don't think I can finish a message like this without an opportunity to pray over you and pray with you. And Some of you may be struggling in your calling. Some of you may be struggling in the equipping process. Well, I volunteered and nobody called me. Don't wait for someone to call you. My friend, don't wait for someone to call you. Put some, put some motion in your lotion or lotion in your motion and get some movement and just begin to step out and say, okay, Lord, I don't know how this works, but I see this and I see what I can do. And God will begin to equip you. And pretty soon someone will say, man, you're good at that. I didn't even think about you to do that. And God will start speaking into your life and probably take you to another level and then another level and then another level and just begin to grow. I believe, I believe that God is still in the business of calling. I believe that God is still in the business of equipping. And I believe God is still in the business of sending. And so, uh, worship, I don't know if you exactly how you close out a service, but... I really feel in my heart to have you respond to just say, Pastor, Chaplain, I feel I, need, I feel I need prayer for the call of God and the purpose of God in my life. And if you just raise up a hand real quickly and put it back down, real quickly just say,
Pray for me. Yes, pray for me. Yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, I'm a believer that you're speaking into the hearts and lives of people. And I'm a believer that things are going to change in this world because we're not spinning toward hell. But there's a redemptive plan. The Redeemer is still at work. And so I pray for these that have raised their hand to say, yes, Lord. Lord, speak into their life. Holy Spirit, be their partner in their steps. I pray Galatians 5.25 over them that they keep in step with the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, be their partner to the purpose that you have for them. Open up their heart's door wide and so that they'll hear, recognize, and respond to the call of God, to a purpose, to a plan in their life. I pray it in Jesus' name. I pray a blessing on this congregation. As I stretch out my hands, I pray a blessing as they go. I pray, Lord, that you lead them, you guide them, and I pray a blessing on their pastor and his wife. I pray, Lord, that you take the time that they're away and rejuvenate them. Bring, I pray, some tremendous insight into their pastor. Make him a continued blessing. Thank you for the, the way that you have built in Scott the ability to encourage the body of Christ. Bless their pastor. Bless his wife. I pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people at Matt Sue said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. I'll remain here if you want some prayer. I'm going to stay here for a little bit and, and we'll pray over you. God bless you. Thank you for allowing me to share with you this morning.